Well, good morning to all of you who are uh, tuning in on YouTube. Um, I must say, I do miss, I really do miss seeing your faces. And part of the reason I'm uh, reminded of that is because you, you can't tell this uh, from where you're watching, but uh, there are some uh, paper plate faces uh, in the seats, um, not in the entire congregation, but over here, um, which is very sweet, but it's not the same uh, as seeing your faces. And I do look forward to the day uh, when we will be able to see each other face to face and, and gather together once again in, in worship. But uh, this is where God has placed us, and uh, for now, at least. And so we come this morning together uh, to worship our God, to enjoy the communion of the saints in our various places, and exalt His holy name together. So let me open us in a word of prayer, and then we will uh, look at the scripture together. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we do long to see one another's faces. And Lord, that is a reminder to us of the longing that we do have to see you face to face one day. And so Lord, we we do pray during this unique time in our lives, as we are scattered about, that, Lord, we uh, would be renewed, strengthened in that desire to, uh, to see your face. And, Lord, to look to that day when we will be with you forevermore, that we will be gathered together in worship forever, that, Lord, we will not be restricted from doing that ever again. And, O oh Lord, we will sing your praises forevermore. And so, Lord, as we gather this morning, we pray that you would help us to do that and to do that in anticipation of that glorious future that awaits us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak uh, through me uh, your words of truth to your people, that we, Lord, together would be reminded of your promises, that we, O oh Lord, would be drawn to see you more clearly, to see the, the wonder, the glory of the gospel more deeply as we open your scriptures together. Speak to our hearts. Transform us, O oh Lord, by the power of your Spirit. And we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, today we are beginning a new sermon series, which uh, we are titling, How Long, O Lord, Trusting God in Troubling Times. And we're going to be looking at a selection of psalms, uh, psalms that are categorized as lament psalms. Now, when we talk about lament in our culture, it's something we're really not that familiar or, or maybe comfortable with, All right? We either tend to view lament as a very negative thing, right? As maybe in our minds, it comes off as sort of a, a form of complaining against God, or, or maybe we see uh, laments as a tool, right, to ask God to, uh, for retribution against those whom we uh, believe have wronged us, a tool for revenge, we might say. But it's important for us to understand that lament has an important place in the life of God's people. There are times when either individual or corporate lament, and we will look at both through the course of our, our study, 
that, that there are times when lament is an appropriate response for God's people. Times of disaster, distress, persecution, oppression, and even extreme health crises. Perhaps, we might say, even in times like these. Uh, but of course, in order to, to understand lament, we, or how to, uh, when it is appropriate, we need to understand, uh, have a proper understanding of biblical lament and how God's people lament before God in a biblical God-honoring way, not, you know, just to get things off our chest or complain for complaining's sake, to release our anger and, and so on, uh, but rather uh, to do so uh, properly in the eyes of God. And so that's what we're going to attempt to do over the next several weeks as we look at a number of examples from the Psalms. Of course, the Psalms are not the only example of lament in the Bible. Uh, the book of Lamentations, uh, for example, the book of Habakkuk, even the New Testament uh, provides some examples of lament. But our focus, of course, will be on uh, a selection of Psalms. Now, there are a few elements, basic elements, that uh, commentators will point out at that are consistent with psalms of lament, uh, though they don't always appear in the same order or include, you know, the same uh, exact content. You know, it's not a cookie-cutter type of thing. But essentially, there are three parts to a biblical lament. There was a, a Ligonier article a few years back that did a, a good job of laying this out. The first uh, part is a calling out to God. Uh, this is where, uh, you know, the complaint uh, aspect, I guess we could say, uh, where that is expressed. The raw emotion of the psalmist is laid bare before the Lord. That's where we hear such things as, I am in distress, O oh Lord. How... You know, how could you allow this, whatever it might be, to happen, oh Lord? That's the first part. The second part is a turning to God, a, a request for God's help for him to act in a particular situation. This is right where we see the, the request for God to deliver the psalmist, say, from his enemies, or the situation that he is in. But nevertheless, right, it's a request that is made to God to deliver from the current distress. Thirdly, an expression of faith and trust in God. This is often where we see the, the psalmist uh, seemingly break into song praising God for who he is, what he has done, and an expression of confidence that God will act in this situation according to his nature and accomplish his purposes in the world and in the life of the psalmist. And so that's the uh, the basic pattern they see that we see and certainly there, there's a variation within uh, this broad structure, but uh, we'll look at each psalm individually and see that. Uh, but, the, but the psalms, these psalms of lament, teach us that important reality of responding faithfully in troubling times. And so uh, we're going to do that. We're going to begin by reading with, with Psalm 13. This is the word of the Lord. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, 
lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Well, this is the word of our God. Thanks be to God for his holy and inerrant word. Well, Sinclair Ferguson, in his book, Deserted by God, he shares a story of an English missionary. Uh, named Alan Gardner. And uh, this particular missionary's body uh, was found in a boat where he had spent the last few days of his life. Uh, The ship that he was in had wrecked on a small island near the southern tip of Argentina. And so uh, he was found there. And The account of those last days of his life was preserved in a journal that he kept and was found near his body. And in that journal, he described the experience that he went through. He described some of the pains of of hunger and thirst, uh, the physical pain that he underwent during those very dark days as he died slowly in isolation. But in the midst of these dark descriptions, these candid entries of the reality of suffering that he underwent, and uh, in the midst of the letters that he had written to his family that he did not know whether or not they would ever receive, was written this one final journal entry, which he penned these words, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Not abandoned, forsaken, forgotten by God, but overwhelmed with God's goodness. We hear those words and perhaps we wonder, how does one express such faith in times like those? Well, this morning we're going to look at a psalm that expresses such faith. And we're going to look at this psalm in two parts. The darkness of distress. And secondly, living in the light of God's grace. So to begin with, the darkness of distress. When we read David's words here in Psalm 13, which we just read, uh, there can be no doubt that David was in a dark place, right? Four times in this fairly short psalm, he asks the question, how long, right? How long, O Lord, will you allow this situation that I am in to endure. Now, the fact that he asks it four times tells us just how distressed he was. And, you know, I'm sure we could try to think of some of the more distressing situations in David's life. We have a number of those accounts in uh, the Scripture Um, but we're not told exactly in this particular psalm what it was. I mean, some commentators have suggested it was a a battle uh, that he was in. Some have suggested it was a deadly illness that he was facing. Um, But the fact is, this particular psalm does not give us the particular circumstances. 
Now, if, you know, if you're familiar with the Psalms, you know that sometimes the Psalms do give us very specific details of what uh, the situation was in which the psalmist is expressing uh, the words of the psalm. And it is very helpful in those psalms to know the situation and to, you know, kind of give us additional nuance of the words that the psalmist uh, is saying. Um, but also, there are some psalms like this one where we are not given the details, and we see that there's actually some advantage to that as well in not knowing the exact circumstances. Because as we read these words, we, are, we, we understand them without knowing the details. They, they, they sort of take on an almost universal application. In other words, it doesn't really matter what the exact circumstance was because the experience of the psalmist is applicable to any distress that we might face even today. And so David gives us uh, his emotional state. He expresses his emotional state before the Lord here uh, in verses 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, how long? How long will these circumstances last? Will you forget me forever? And as we hear him say those words, we begin to see one of the flaws in his way of thinking, don't we? You see, what David is, has done here at the beginning of this psalm in these first two verses is he has taken what is a temporal situation, whether it's a military conflict, whether it's a, you know, a physical uh, ailment, a severe health situation. Uh, he has begun to think that maybe this is a permanent reality for him, right? Will you forget me forever? Are you going to continue, God, to hide your face from me? Will I continue to have sorrow in my heart? And will my enemy continue to exalt over me? Whatever enemy he's talking about. And while we hear that, we, we can see, of course, the absurdity of thinking in this way. At least when it's somebody else thinking this way. And then we're reminded that we can do the same thing. We can fall into the same sort of mindset, can't we? Lord, is it always going to be like this? Will the circumstances of my life never change from the way they are now? Will I ever find a suitable employment? Will I always be alone? Will I always have to live in isolation? Am I always going to have to wear a mask in public? Will I always feel this miserable? And I love the way Dr. Ferguson describes the psalmist's state When he says the psalmist's problem was that he couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And we can see here that he seems to have felt that God had forgotten him. Perhaps even turned his back on him. That's not a good place to be, is it? Now, let me just say this, if you're listening to this message this morning and you feel like that, you feel that God has forgotten you, that he has turned his back on you, you feel as the psalmist felt, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, then first of all, keep listening. But also here right now, you need to know that that you are not alone. 
Yes, you might be in your house alone this morning listening to this, but, but you are not alone in your struggle. First of all, there are others who feel the very same way that you do right now. Even King David felt this way at one time in his life. But more importantly, most importantly, there is one who was truly forsaken by God. One who was truly smitten, stricken, and afflicted. One whom the Father did turn His back on so that you and I, by faith, would never be forgotten. That we would never be forsaken. That we would never be truly alone. So that we could always see the light at the end of the tunnel. The true light. The Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again for you and me. And ultimately, that is where this psalm points us. But the psalmist is in the midst of a struggle here. How long, O Lord? And notice the expression he uses there in verse 2. He says, How long must I take counsel in my soul? may sound a, a strange saying, take counsel in my soul. And again, Dr. Ferguson, I think, does a good job. And he, he points out that the wording here really captures the conflict that is going on within the, the mind and the heart of David. That his mind and his emotions are sort of doing battle that his emotions, how he feels about his current circumstances are driving the way that he is thinking about things. And it's this endless cycle that is going on that keeps him from seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. It is this, this conflict that is causing him to question God's faithfulness to his promises. And I think we've probably all been there before. But what David needs, and frankly what we need, is for God's truth to break into that cycle and begin to make us think and ultimately feel rightly about the circumstances of our lives, to give us a right perspective on the world around us. And that brings us to our second point. First, the darkness, but secondly, living in the light of God's grace. In verse 3, we see that David begins to pray. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. As we hear that prayer, it's as though David is reminded once again of the covenant promises of God. And as Ferguson and others have noted, it is even in his opening expression of distress that we, we hear the, the covenant language as, as he even recalls God's promises in his distress, right? That, that as he is expressing the darkness of his distress, he is brought face to face with the reality that even though he may feel abandoned by God, the reality is that God is right there with him. And he is praying to that God who is right there with him in the midst of his distress. And it's the promises of God and from the psalmist's initial 
perspective, the, the failure of God to meet those promises that, that form the basis of his, his distress. His distress. And, and now, as he begins to turn to God in prayer, as uh, based upon the truth of God's word, who God is, the promises of God's covenant, the psalmist comes in prayer, asking him to act, not just on his behalf, but for the sake of God's kingdom, that the enemies of God would not prevail. And in doing this, the psalmist is having his mind begin to be changed as he is beginning to be gain a right perspective on the situation he is in. He is beginning to see that ultimately all of this is not about his current circumstances and his current trouble. It's about the greater picture of God's kingdom and the redemptive purposes that God has established in the world. Commentators have noted that his prayer here, when he says, consider me, answer me, light up my eyes, that it, it's, it's reflective of the uh, ironic benediction, Numbers 6, 24 to 26, which you'll hear later uh, today when, when you know, the, the, those, those precious words, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The, the blessings of God pronounced upon the people of God. And so the psalmist is reminded of those promises and asks for God to make those promises a reality in his life even now. And it's important to see this transition that is happening in this psalm. What begins with feelings of abandonment, hopelessness, isolation that the psalmist was experiencing in his current circumstances, that they are quickly turned into expressions of hope and faith and trust in God, when the truth of God's word, God's promises, the reality of who God is, is brought to bear in his life. It is God's truth breaking into the cycle of doubt and despair to bring a right perspective on all things. You see, brothers and sisters, that is what we need. We need the light of God's truth to speak into our lives, to give us a right perspective on what is going on in the world. Not the news, right? Not what our friends are saying about things, not our own speculations and opinions about things, but God's holy, inerrant, and forever true word. We must store it up in our hearts. Like the psalmist did. So that in those times of despair, the word of God will speak clearly into our lives. You see, we, we must meditate on it. We, we need to remind ourselves of the promises of God given to us in Holy Scripture. We must study it, read it, and live it according to the power of God's Spirit at work in our hearts with the Word and the Spirit working together to conform us to the image of Christ. That will bring a proper perspective on things, brothers and sisters. But the most important thing that the psalmist came to know and feel is 
Not only that there was a light at the end of the tunnel, but understanding that the light at the end of the tunnel was not the resolution of his circumstances. It was not the removal of affliction from his life, whatever the nature of those afflictions were. No, what the psalmist came to understand is that the light at the end of the tunnel was God himself. The light was the fellowship, the salvation that the psalmist already had because of the faithfulness of the one who gives it. You see, that is true hope and peace. That is the unfailing covenant love of God. Even in the midst of trial and deep distress, the light of God's unfailing love shines brightly in the darkness. And so, brothers and sisters, let us remember this. Let us remember that our hope, the light at the end of the tunnel, is not the end of the pandemic. It is not the resumption of business as usual, right? It's not the restoration of our economy. It's, it's not even our being able to gather together again in worship and fellowship this side of glory. No, our hope, the light at the end of the tunnel is God himself, the salvation that God has given to us in Jesus Christ by faith. We need to remember that, brothers and sisters. And it is only when we remember it and, and see this truly that we begin to gain a right perspective on what is going on in our world and in our lives. And it is only when we gain this right perspective that we will be able to proclaim as the missionary Alan Gardner did in the face of extreme anguish and even death that we are overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Or to use the language of the psalmist, that we will be able to rejoice in God regardless of our circumstances and be able to sing to the Lord because of how bountifully he has dealt with us. So, dear friends, let us, let us remind ourselves once again of the unfailing love of God. And let us look to Christ, the one who was truly abandoned by God, who truly slept the sleep of death, as the psalmist says, and but whom darkness could not overcome because of the inextinguishable light of his glorious grace. So brothers and sisters, let us trust in the steadfast love of God in Christ. Let us rejoice in our salvation. Let us sing to the Lord for he has dealt with us far more bountifully than we could ever ask or imagine. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we do thank you for your glorious grace, which you have poured out to us in Christ Jesus. Oh, Lord, it is hard sometimes to, to see the light in the midst of the darkness of this world and 
even, Lord, our own hearts and minds, that we, O oh Lord, get so clouded with the cares and concerns of the world that we lose our vision. We lose our perspective on things. Would you, O oh Lord, work in our hearts to give us that gospel perspective? to see things rightly, that your light indeed would shine upon us as we look to the true light, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray all this now in his name. Amen. Let us rise now for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.